we've got, as you can see on the screen, which I can't actually read. So, uh, we would also like to thank Beatrice for supporting this event and they've supplied FIP an unrestricted grant. Okay, so our program for today is going to be understanding migraine and medication overuse headache. How can pharmacists better support patients? Uh, so I am the moderator. My name's Tara Hare. I'm the president of the social and administrative pharmacy section. Our first speaker will be Jacinta Johnson. She's a senior lecturer in pharmacy at the University of South Australia in Australia. And our second speaker is Pernilla Vichikeli, uh, who's the Associate Professor in Public Health and, Pharma and Pharmacists uh, at the University of Skåde in the School of Health Sciences in Sweden. Uh, this uh, webinar has actually been accredited for one hour of group activities of CPD by the Australian Pharmacy Council. Um, and this can be converted to one hour of group two CPD points upon successful completion of the assessment questions. Okay, so today's uh, program is going to explain in depth the use of migraine medications and new treatments that are available and how medication overuse headache can be treated and prevented by pharmacist strategies. So our learning objectives today, we will review clinical practice guidelines for the pharmacological management of migraine to guide medication selection and optimization. We'll compare and contrast different medicines classes for acute and preventative migraine treatment regarding efficacy, contraindications, side effects and patient considerations. We'll demonstrate use of shared decision-making when recommending individualized migraine treatment plans considering patient preferences and lifestyle factors. We'll describe the key characteristics of medication overuse headache, including its diagnostic criteria, risk factors, and its relation to primary episodic headaches. And recognize the potential role of pharmacists in advising and pretend preventing medication overuse headache, including their capacity to provide guidance on over-the-counter medications and raise awareness about medication overuse headache amongst patients. To start off, we're going to run through the series of assessment questions just to see the knowledge that our attendees have prior to listening to our speakers. And then we'll run the poll again at the end to see how much our knowledge on this topic has improved. So I think we will have 60 seconds for each topic. So please choose your most appropriate answer. Which of the following statements regarding the general principles of migraine management is false? All right, next question. The dose of which tryptan should be reduced by half in patients taking propranolol due to a drug-drug interaction? Make your selection of the four choices.
Okay, question three. Which of the following counselling points is most appropriate to discuss with a patient who is using uh, lasmidotan for acute migraine? Okay, question number four. Which of the below for migraine? Not diagnostic headache. At rehabilitation, continue using the same way as this.
medication to be used. Speak a little closer to the phone. Question will be Does this help this headache? Okay. Our first speaker today is Jacinta Johnson. Jacinta is an advanced practice pharmacist and lecturer in pharmacy at the University of South Australia Clinical and Health Sciences. Her, she is going to be speaking on understanding migraine management from a pharmacy and self-care perspective, current and emerging treatment options. Jacinta. Thank you very much, Tara. Can everybody hear me okay? I'll take it as yes, so there's one thumb up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, FIP, to come and speak today about migraine. It's an area I'm really passionate about as a migraine sufferer myself. So I'm really heartened to see so many people from around the world um, coming along to learn more about migraine. So I'd like to start my presentation today with an acknowledgement of country. So uh, where I live in the Adelaide Plains region of South Australia, uh, the traditional custodians of the land are the Ghana people, a particular group of Aboriginal people. So I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to the Ghana's elders past and present. All right, so we know migraine is a big problem. It affects more than a billion people across the world. And the global burden of disease uh, study shows us that the disability inflicted uh, on the population by migraine is actually greater than the disability for all other neurological conditions combined. We've got lots of different treatment options available for migraine, both uh, acute treatments that help to terminate migraine attacks and preventative treatments. And, but despite having so many available options, we know that clinical care remains suboptimal for a lot of people. Um, we have some people who use too much medication, like you'll hear about in the next presentation, other people that don't use enough, or people that are just using, uh, I guess, a medication that's not the best choice for them. So that means as pharmacists, we're really well positioned to help people to optimize migraine management. And I'm going to run through um, some, 
I guess, refreshes. Some might be refreshes, some might be updates for you. Um, I'll hopefully touch on a few of the newer drugs that have come out that you may be less familiar with uh, so that you are um, armed with the knowledge you need to help uh, people navigate uh, migraine treatment so they can optimise their own care. So first of all, I will run through uh, abort abortive agents, so those acute treatments for migraine, and then later in the presentation, I'll talk about preventative treatment options. So one of the learning objectives was to discuss treatment guidelines, and I know we've got people from all over the world in this session, and the availability of a lot of different drugs that we use in migraine management is different, uh, and the regulation of those drugs is different depending on where you live. So instead of going through specific treatment algorithms uh, when I discuss guidelines, I've included general principles that hopefully are adaptable regardless of where you're practicing. So for all patients, the goal of treating a migraine is to alleviate symptoms. Usually the most prominent symptom is the headache pain itself, but we know that migraine does come with a broad range of other symptoms as well, including that sensitivity um, to other stimuli like light and sound and uh, nausea and um, potentially vomiting as well. So we want to try and alleviate all of those symptoms with our acute treatment. The choice of treatment should be patient-centered. So we want to think about the patient's comorbidities, their current medications, uh, often pregnancy and breastfeeding, given the cohort of patients that uh, experience migraine are often of childbearing potential. Uh, and then we want to think about the person's individual migraine experience as well. So what treatment, what symptoms are most burdensome for them? Uh, and what does the duration or the timing of their migraine attack look like? Do they have short attacks, long attacks? Uh, when do those gastrointestinal symptoms kick in if they experience them at all? And we can tailor our treatment to best manage um, those particular things that are important to the patient. Because we do like to use such an individualized approach to migraine treatment, uh, we do often require a bit of trial and error. So that's where you as the pharmacist can become really helpful. If someone's tried this and they've tried that, you can be the one coming up with the new ideas. Well, what about we do this next? And how about this after that? And sort of work your way through all the different options that are available. Regardless of what treatment you're looking at, if you're trying to abort a migraine, for all of them, it's best to give the medication early in the headache phase. So not in the aura phase, if it is a patient who does experience aura before their migraine, but once the headache pain does start to develop before it becomes severe, that's the optimal time for the person to take their migraine treatment. Doesn't mean that treatments aren't effective if they're taken later in the attack, but they're most effective if they're taken early early during that headache phase of the attack. And we can, of course, combine the acute migraine treatments that we have with non-pharmacological strategies. So the classic is uh, giving advice to rest, uh, try and get some sleep in a quiet, dark area, because we know sleep is quite good usually at terminating a migraine attack. And then there are other, uh, I guess, lifestyle changes that can be made. So people can identify triggers that uh, might set off their individual migraines. Uh, often using a headache diary is a good way to identify what things make their headaches worse or their migraines worse. And then they can avoid those things. Um, but often patients find things like having a regular exercise schedule, um, eating regularly, so not skipping meals, uh, can help with preventing migraines as well. Okay, so what drugs can we use? There are a, a wide range of drug classes that are effective for migraine, including the simple or non-opioid analgesics like acetaminophen or paracetamol and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the triptan medications, anti-emetic drugs, ergots, and there's some other sort of miscellaneous older treatments that are still useful. And then there's a, a new range of drugs coming out. So we'll talk a little bit about those shortly, the G-pants and the ditans. Starting first with the non-opioid analgesics. And these are often the first line treatment, uh, particularly if the migraine is um, mild to moderate, uh, we would start with something like um, aspirin. It's usually a go-to. It's one of the older medications for migraine, but we know it is really effective and it is really cheap and accessible as well. So you can combine a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory with paracetamol or acetaminophen or with other treatments for migraine that we'll talk about shortly. 
uh, like an antiemetic. And uh, when you're actually looking at which simple analgesic to choose, we again go back to that patient-centered focus and thinking about the adverse effect profile of the medication compared with the patient's comorbidities and other medications perhaps they might be taking. And if one is not effective, we can trial another. So if one uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is not effective for a patient's migraine, it doesn't mean that they won't respond to any anti-inflammatories. So if someone does try aspirin and it's not effective, they could still respond to ibuprofen or diclofenac. And these are just some examples. I know there are a huge number of different anti-inflammatories available in different regions as well. But what you will notice here is that the doses we use in migraine for the simple analgesics are right at the high end of the dosing spectrum. So for aspirin, you might otherwise use 300, 500 milligrams for acute pain. In migraine, we push that all the way to 900 or 1,000 milligrams uh, in one hit to hopefully get that uh, migraine under control and abort its ongoing uh, progress. It's important to think about formulation as well. So some medications are available as soluble products, which can help uh, with absorption. So they're absorbed more quickly before the gastrointestinal stasis that we know occurs in migraine kicks in, uh, because that stasis can be a barrier that prevents absorption of analgesics. And if the medication is not being absorbed, then it can't work to relieve the migraine. Uh, the other thing you might think about is that um, attack kind of pattern that people mention uh, when you're asking about what their migraines are actually like. So if they usually have sort of shorter but really intense migraines, maybe something like a, a big dose of aspirin is going to be effective for them. But if they have a, sort of a more milder migraine, but it's really prolonged in duration and it comes back if they use aspirin, maybe an NSAID with a longer half-life like naproxen uh, might be more suitable for them. So that's where that trial and error comes in and where you as the pharmacist can help the patient to navigate the different options that are available. You might also think about the side effect profile for NSAIDs and the patient's comorbidities. So if the patient has got a history of cardiovascular effects, you might avoid those uh, NSAIDs that are more COX-2 selective. Or if they've got a history of uh, gastrointestinal issues, a stomach ulcer, for example, you might avoid those NSAIDs that are more COX-1 selective. Okay, moving now straight along into triptans. So triptans are a migraine-specific abortive agent. They work by activating a particular type of serotonin receptor. Uh, originally, we thought that caused vasoconstriction, and that's what helped to alleviate the migraine attack. But we now know it's a bit more complicated than that. And in addition to causing vasoconstriction, we know the triptans also reduce release of a whole range of inflammatory mediators in the brain that helps to um, abort the migraine attack. These are sometimes considered second line, sometimes considered first line agents, depending on where you are. Uh, but if you haven't responded to simple analgesics, then certainly a triptan would be indicated. Or if you've got just really uh, severe migraine um, or moderate to severe migraine from the outset, you might try a triptan first up, uh, even if they haven't uh, necessarily failed treatment with a, a simple analgesic. Usually you would start with a lower dose. So most triptans come in a couple of different dosing strengths. You would usually typically start with a lower dose. And if that's tolerated, but not uh, completely effective, you might try a higher dose in a subsequent attack. If the patient does respond to that triptan and they get relief, but the headache reoccurs, then they can redose with the triptan within the attack, usually after about two hours, but it does depend on which triptan you're talking about. However, if the patient doesn't respond to the triptan in that attack, there's no point dosing again with the triptan within the same attack because that attack is likely to be unresponsive to triptan therapy. That doesn't mean a triptan won't work next time they have a migraine, and we would usually get someone to trial using a triptan at least three for three separate attacks before we say that they're not responsive to that triptan. And importantly, similar to the NSAIDs, response to one triptan doesn't necessarily predict response to another. So what I see a lot here is someone who's tried sumatriptan perhaps as the kind of first triptan that, that comes to mind uh, and they haven't responded to that and they sort of rule out all triptans. They think I don't, they don't work for me. But it might be that if they actually tried a different triptan medication, it would still be effective for them. There are some contraindications and precautions with triptans to be aware of. Because of their vasoconstrictive effects, uh, they are contraindicated in cerebrovascular and cardiovascular disease in the conditions outlined on the slide. 
And we would usually recommend avoiding them in pregnancy, again, because of their vasoconstrictive effects, but it's not an absolute contraindication. So as always with pregnancy, it's a bit of a, a risk benefit assessment. And if no other options work, it may be suitable to use a, a triptan in pregnancy under uh, medical advice. In breastfeeding, the drug we've got most experience with is sumatriptan, and it seems unlikely to cause harm. Some drug interactions to be aware of, because the triptans are serotonergic agents, there is potential that they can cause serotonin syndrome, at least in theory. In practice, we don't see that reported very often, though it's quite rare, and um, it's particularly rare if the triptan is only being used intermittently. Uh, several of the triptans are uh, metabolized by monoamine oxidase. So if someone is using a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, then those triptans would be contraindicated as well. And uh, on the next slide here, I've got some more information about specific drug interactions. So if you look on the far side in the notes column, um, some drugs like almatriptan and elatriptan are CYP3A4 substrates. So they're susceptible to drug interactions uh, from CYP3A4 inhibitors. And uh, thinking back to your multiple choice questions, if you have a look at the uh, rizotriptan line, you'll see it's the one that actually interacts with propranolol. So propranolol increases the concentration of rizotriptan and can increase the incidence of those vasoconstrictive uh, ischemic adverse effects. So we would usually halve the dose of rizotriptan if someone's using propranolol. And I bring up that example specifically because, uh, as you might recall, propranolol is one of the medications that can be indicated for migraine prophylaxis. So it might be one of the drugs you see in patients who are likely to be prescribed a triptan. So this table summarizes the different triptans that are available in different areas. So most countries will have some selection, probably not all of these drugs available. Uh, they are generally considered on par in terms of efficacy. There are some slight differences between them. Uh, so almatriptan and elatriptan tend to be the best tolerated. Elatriptan and rizotriptan tend to work the fastest for the oral medications. Uh, if that's still not fast enough, there is a, a subcutaneous formulation of sumatriptan that can be used. And sumatriptan and zolmatriptan uh, in some areas also come as a nasal spray. So if nausea is a problem, there are non-oral formulations of triptans available um, for those patients. Again, thinking about the pattern someone's migraine goes through, if they are someone who tends to have really prolonged migraines that find their um, head pain comes back after using a triptan, then using a triptan that's got a longer half-life can be a, a useful strategy. So in that case, you might look at something like narotriptan or fovratriptan as a longer acting triptan alternative. Okay, moving from triptans now, I feel like I'm flying through these, but I know um, time is tight, so I'll keep moving through. Uh, antiemetics. So antiemetics uh, can be really useful in migraine because the gastrointestinal side effects, nausea and vomiting uh, can be really distressing. For some patients, that's worse than the actual head pain they experience. And the other gastrointestinal side effect we see in migraine is that slowing of the gastrointestinal tract, which can reduce absorption of other analgesic agents. So if you use a dopaminergic um, antiemetic, then you can get some uh, prokinetic effects as well that in theory can help to promote absorption of other analgesics as well. So metoclopramide is probably the medication we have the most evidence for in migraine, uh, but some of the other agents are used um, in other areas around the world as well. Uh, Prochlorperazine as a sedating antihistamine has an advantage in that it can help people to get to sleep. And as I mentioned before, sleep can help to terminate a migraine. So some patients might find that preferable. For others, that might actually be a drawback, though, if it makes them uh, drowsy. And then on Dancitron, uh, at least in Australia, we don't see it used too much in migraine, but it is an option if patients don't tolerate the dopaminergic or older classes of antiemetics. Other agents we've got include agotamine. So in many places around the world, agotamine will still uh, be used. It's been uh, used in migraine management for 70 odd years now, and we know it works, uh, but it is less safe than the triptans. So in areas where triptans are readily available, they have largely replaced agotamine. And certainly triptans and agotamine should not be used together. That's a contraindication. And similar to the triptans, ergotamine does cause um, those vasoconstrictive effects. So it would be contraindicated in uncontrolled hyper, hypertension as well. 
Caffeine is a good one uh, for some people and, and not a good idea for others. So it, we know it does improve the efficacy when it's combined with simple analgesics and uh, with agotamine. But for some patients, uh, they might find caffeine actually worsens their migraines as well. So it is isn't one where you've got to sort of look at an individual uh, patient level and see whether or not um, this medication is useful for them. Doxalamine, similar to some of the sedating antihistamines that are used for nausea, it can be helpful in inducing sleep for some patients. And then finally, on the list of miscellaneous include opioids. So opioids, including low-dose codeine and including tramadol, should be avoided in the treatment of migraine. We don't have very good evidence that they work, and we know they can increase uh, the gastrointestinal symptoms that uh, patients are already going through with migraine. Uh, and they're just, um, you know, very messy medications. Things can go wrong with opioids. They're, they're high risk. So given that we don't have good evidence that they work, we will avoid them for migraine. On to the newer agents now for acute treatment, the ditans. So I, I say it like it's a whole class, but there is only one ditan that has been approved, and that is lesmetidan. So it was the first uh, agent approved uh, in 2019 by the FDA and then approved by the, F, uh, the European Commission in 2022. Uh, and it's got a similar effect to triptans without being vasoconstrictive. So it's an agonist at a different, a slightly different serotonin receptor compared to the triptans. But the effect we see is the same in that it is able to terminate migraines, but it doesn't cause um, the, the constriction of blood vessels. So it's not contraindicated in patients who have those um, conditions that would rule out use of a triptan. It's an oral, uh, a medication that's given orally and it's a once-off dose, so usually single dose and it's not redosed within a 24-hour period. Um, the side effect to be aware of, so again, just a little flag for your MCQs, uh, is that it can cause fatigue and dizziness, um, so much so that uh, driving within eight hours of taking the medication is not advised at all. And even after that period, patients should be careful when driving. Uh, another important consideration, given this is such a new medication, is that uh, we don't know about the safety of using it on a, a very regular basis. So at the moment, the data we've got uh, hasn't established safety treating more than uh, treating on more than four times uh, four occasions during a, a 30 day period. So we don't know yet whether this medication is going to cause medication overuse headache. When we look at how this new agent, the Ditan, uh, compares with uh, some of the GPANTs, which is another new class of medications that I'll talk about shortly, uh, with some of the older medications like the triptans, uh, we can see here from the meta-analysis, because there aren't any um, good head-to-head -head studies yet, that uh, the newer medications are more effective than placebo, but perhaps not quite as effective as uh, a lot of the triptans are. So that's sort of where they sit in the hierarchy of effectiveness, but remembering that the newer medications don't have those same contraindications because they don't have the vasoconstrictive effects we see with the triptans. Okay, here we go, uh, G-pants. So the G-pants are a, oh, now I've got a lag. Sorry, I should have been patient. That'll come back shortly. Here we are. All right. The G-pants are a, a class of small molecule medications that uh, antagonize or block the calcitonin gene-related peptide. Uh, so CGRP, we know, has a causative role in migraine. And uh, because since that discovery, we've been looking at ways we can target this mediator to help improve things for migraine sufferers. So the G-pants are one class of medications, and I'll talk about monoclonal antibodies to CGRP shortly in prevention. So G-pants are generally considered um, to fall into different generations. So the first generations of G-pants uh, were in development probably about 15 years ago, and clinical testing of those was actually halted because of a risk of hepatotoxicity. So we then moved into the second generation of G-pants, and the first of those, Remedjapant, was uh, registered in uh, 2020 by the FDA, and it was registered for acute and preventative treatment, which is really interesting. So I've included it here under the acute treatments, but it does also fall into the preventative category. We then have uh, Atajapant, which is another second generation um, medication in this class, and it's only approved for prevention. And then we have two others, Ibrojapant and Zabedjapant, and they are uh, for acute treatment only, so not for prevention. 
So a bit of a mixed class, uh, and most of them are taken orally, except for Zvegepan, which is an intranasal spray. So again, another option for people that can't take things orally uh, because of nausea or vomiting in migraine. So things are looking good. They tend to be a, quite a well-tolerated medication, but we don't know yet what the long-term side effects are, noting that CGRP is involved in a whole range of other processes around the body. So almost a bit of a, a wait and see um, how they go in terms of long-term safety. So when it comes to counselling on acute migraine treatments, this is a, a rough kind of outline of the things I think uh, we should be discussing with patients where we can really add value. So one is talking about the role of the medicine, specifically highlighting those drugs that are abortive treatments only. So some patients, uh, it's hard to differentiate between what's a migraine treatment and what's just a regular pain medicine. And you want to make that really clear so that someone's not trying to use a triptan to treat a, a sore sprained ankle or something like that. So making sure it's clear when it's a, a migraine abortive medication, then talking about the dosing and highlighting that they should be taking the medication as soon as the head pain develops rather than the aura or what, rather than waiting until the head pain is severe. Then you can run through what to expect. So what time frame should they start to see a benefit, which is of course dependent on the drug and then what to do around redosing. So what to do if the medication is effective and then the headache comes back or what do they do if it's not effective? What's their next choice? What can they try after that? Adverse effects, of course, you can run through what to be aware of and also uh, think about medication overuse headache, as you'll hear about shortly. Uh, we can discuss self-care, including the headache diary, and we can recommend follow-up. So particularly thinking about conditional referrals as well. If the acute treatments aren't working, if we think uh, prophylaxis might be indicated, which I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, or if their headaches get worse, then certainly they should be seeing their GP for regular review of their migraines. Moving now through to migraine prophylaxis. So migraine prophylaxis should be considered based on a few different factors. Um, one is the headache frequency and duration. So how often is the patient getting the migraine and is it lasting a really long time? Uh, and tied to that is the response to abortive therapy. So if the medication works really well, maybe it's not such a big deal if the person is getting quite frequent migraines because those migraines are, are easily treated. So typically we would say if someone is experiencing more than two or three migraines a month or they have more than four days with migraine across a, a, a one-month period, then that would be a suggestion to talk to their doctor about migraine prophylaxis. Uh, and then tied in with all of that is loss of function. So if someone only has one migraine a month, but it wipes them out completely, they have to take time off work for several days, um, that loss of function would be an indication for uh, prophylaxis as well. How do we choose which prophylactic medication? Again, we take a patient-based approach. So thinking about the patient's characteristics versus the drug side effect profile, rather than sort of starting with drug A and working through drug B in, in the same order for everyone. And we usually would start with a lower dose and then titrate up until we see effect. We need at least one, uh, often up to three months to trial it to work out whether or not that medication is that sufficiently effective. And really important role for us as pharmacists is to confirm adherence because we know typically adherence to migraine prophylaxis is not great, uh, either because patients experience side effects or they don't think it's working. So that's something you can check in on routinely, particularly if someone is coming in for uh, abortive therapies or you know, asking for pain relief at the pharmacy. And if the prophylaxis is effective for a period of at least three to six months, then we can look at tapering it off. Um, it's not necessarily a lifelong treatment. So what's really interesting about the drugs we use for migraine prophylaxis is there's no common mechanism of action. And a lot of the medications that we do use were actually initially developed for other conditions, whether they were developed as antidepressants, perhaps anticonvulsants or antihypertensives. There seems to be um, a, a sort of a real mix in there that are effective. Um, there are some that uh, have been developed specifically for migraine now, um, which are the CGRP-directed therapies. And another drug, uh, botulinum uh, toxin A, is also used in migraine prophylaxis, although if you're familiar with Botox, you know it had lots of other indications before we decided we would use it for migraine. So I'll run through a few examples of prophylactic agents now. So beta blockers are, uh, have been a, a a go-to for migraine prophylaxis for a long time. So propranolol and metoprolol in particular, we see a lot of, but they do require at least twice daily dosing. So atenolol is another beta blocker that is effective for migraine that's only once a day that may be more suitable for some patients. 
But what we tend to see with the beta blockers is tolerability issues. So they cause fatigue, exercise intolerance, sexual dysfunction, and depression. And when you think of the cohort that experience migraine, they're often young, otherwise quite active people. Uh, and these things can be really difficult for them to deal with and lead to them actually stopping taking the medication. Other options include amitriptyline, and that one can be particularly useful if the patient has concurrent insomnia, or depression, or tension-type headaches. So we sometimes see that mixed presentation of migraine and tension-type headache, and amitriptyline can be used in prophylaxis of tension-type headache as well. And then pisodophen. So pisodophen is one that actually was developed for migraine use. Uh, we tend to see most of the time it just being used in children these days. It's largely been replaced, uh, and one of the main reasons for that is that it does cause a lot of weight gain. Some of the anti-epileptics we, we use, and this is not an exhaustive list, include valproate and topiramate. Uh, they do have a lot of side effects, though, and they are teratogenic. And again, we see migraine in young women of childbearing potential, so teratogenicity is something to be aware of. Uh, one of the calcium channel blockers that we use is verapamil, and um, perhaps some of these down the bottom here might be a little bit more surprising. They're not necessarily the traditional prophylactic agents we see for migraine, but there are studies that show they are effective and potentially effective in a different cohort compared to beta blockers, uh, and they include lisinopril and candesartan. Uh, and both lisinopril and candesartan can be better tolerated than the, uh, the beta blockers for migraine prophylaxis. One of the newer agents, I say newer, but it was first uh, approved, I think, back in 2011. Um, so we've got some experience with it now is uh, Botox. I think it's a, a bit of an interesting one uh, for a migraine prevention, specifically for chronic migraine prevention, which is a migraine that is occurring very frequently. Uh, it works by preventing acetylcholine release, and that prevents um, the sort of uh, firing of the, the neurons to propagate those um, migraine pain signals. It's quite an intensive procedure to have Botox for migraine. It's somewhere in the range of 30 to 40 injections across the forehead, uh, the temples, the back of the head, and then down the neck as well. And it needs to be administered every 12 weeks because like Botox for other indications, it does wear off um, after that sort of three-month mark. Uh, the trials found it was quite effective, so reducing headache days by um, eight or nine days per month. And this has been reflected in the real world trials as well. But interestingly, if you inject just placebo, so saline in the same places, uh, we see quite a significant reduction in headache days as well. So it may be that there's a reasonable placebo component to uh, Botox use for migraine, but regardless um, whether it's the, a placebo component or the, the active um, component of the drug, we think it does help um, in this quite hard to treat chronic migraine uh, population. And then finally, the last class I talk about will be the CGRP monoclonal antibodies and the antagonists. So the antagonists we've already discussed, they were the G pants. So I won't go um, through those again now. Uh, but there are also monoclonal antibodies that target the same molecule. So that inflammatory mediator, CGRP. So the antibodies against uh, CGRP can bind to the molecule itself, or they might actually bind to and block the receptor. Uh, we know they're effective compared to placebo, but we haven't got many comparative studies yet to show how they stack up against some of the other older prophylactic agents for migraine. The next slide shows uh, the different products that are available in different areas. So Amavig is the one that targets the CGRP receptor. The others all target the CGRP molecule itself, and most of them are available as uh, pens or pre-filled syringes that the patient will administer themselves. And that will either be administered uh, once a month for some of them. Uh, some it's every three months. Um, some need a loading dose, some don't. Uh, and the real kind of the, the different one that stands out there is Viepti, and it's actually given as an infusion. So a patient would need to go to a hospital or a clinic and have a 30 minute infusion every three months rather than self-injecting. So I guess another emerging role for pharmacists in the management of migraine will be helping to train people on how to use the, um, the pens and the syringes to actually administer subcutaneous injections themselves. So to wrap up, uh, my take home points for you are just to recap that we do have lots and lots of options for acute and prophylactic management of migraine and pharmacists have a really important role in helping patients to identify which of those treatments might be best suited to them. So tailoring the, the treatment to the individual's presentation and to their history. 
Uh, pharmacists can also advise on the specific dosing regimes and giving advice to take early in that headache phase to optimize efficacy. We can talk about self-care advice and promote use of a headache diary to not only identify triggers, but also to track which medications work and which medications don't. We can inform patients around the existence of prophylaxis. Lots of patients don't even know you can get medications to prevent migraines and we can uh, direct them to their GP, refer them on to discuss those options. We can counsel to promote the safe and effective use of the acute treatments and the preventative treatments. And we can encourage that regular follow-up so they are getting holistic migraine management by making sure they do see their GP as needed uh, and if any of those um, red flags come up like ineffective acute treatments uh, or if their headaches change or seem to be getting worse. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening and I will hand over to our next speaker, Penilla. So apologies before, I was literally running off a train and trying to speak. I hope you can hear me better now. Our next speaker is Penilla Bekele. Uh, she is an Associate Professor in Public Health and Pharmacists at the University of Skorvega at the School of Health Sciences in Sweden. And Penilla is going to speak to us about overuse of acute medication among individuals with headache disorders, medication overuse headache, and the potential role of pharmacists in advising and preventing medication overuse headache. Thank you, Penilla. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this important topic. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to add, in order to avoid confusion, that my previous surname was Johnson, and you will see this name on, on some of the publications that I refer to during the talk. Okay, so uh, the topic of this part of the session, let me just uh, find the right slide here, sorry, is overuse of acute medication in headache, medication overuse headache, and the potential role of pharmacists in advising and preventing medication overuse headache. And during the presentation, I will uh, start by talking about some common medication related problem in headache. And then we will focus on one particular problem, namely overuse of acute headache medication. Uh, and we will also talk about a type of specific, uh, chronic daily headache that is associated with medication overuse called medication overuse headache. And we will talk about medication overuse headache from several different perspectives, including the patient perspective and, of course, the pharmacy perspective. Sorry, there's a bit of delay when I change the slides. So uh, medications do play an important role in the headache treatment, as we have learned during Jacinta's excellent uh, presentation. In fact, a, a vast majority of persons who suffer from headache use uh, medications to treat their disorder. They can use over-the-counter medication, prescription medication. Uh, and as Jacinta told us, there is preventive medication, which is there to prevent headache attacks. And there is acute medication, which is used to treat the attacks when they occur. And most people with headache use only acute medication uh, and prophylactic medications is uh, recommended when the headache attacks are very frequent. Sorry. So among individuals with headache, uh, we often see two types of medication related problems. There are actually lots more, but I've uh, chosen to focus on these two today. Uh, one of them is poor adherence to prophylactic treatments, and the other one is overuse of acute medication. And both are uh, problematic because both of, uh, both of them leads to increased headache frequency. And during this presentation, I will talk a little bit about poor adherence to prophylactic treatment, and then we will focus on overuse of acute medication, because I think that's a problem that uh, um, refers to, to more patients. Uh, so for the individual headache patient, um, uh, using prophylactic medication means daily medication use. Uh, and this, of course, comes with um, Sorry, <laughs> this of course comes with uh, 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 side effects, adverse events, and other problems related to that. So, 
because of this, clinician often, clinicians often find that their patients are quite reluctant to use uh, prophylactic treatments. And when they do, as Jacinta told us earlier, uh, the, the adherence is sometimes poor. And in uh, my research group, we uh, conducted a study at a small Swedish uh, specialist migraine clinic where we looked at the adherence to prophylactic medication. And we found that about approximately one third of the patients did not adhere to their treatments. And this is uh, quite similar to what has been seen in other studies. And of course, this is problematic because when the prophylactic medication is not used, the prophylactic uh, effect is reduced and the headache frequency increases. And this also increases the need for prophylactic medication. So it's sort of an evil circle. So if we leave the prophylactic medication and go into the acute headache medication, uh, you'll find that here the focus is on preventing overuse. There are strict recommendations for how often acute treatment uh, may be used in headache. Triptans, ergots, opioids and combination analgesics should not be used for more than 10 days per month or more. And uh, simple analgesics should not be used for more than 15 days per month. So the, the limits are a little bit different uh, depending on the risk uh, of inducing medication overuse headache. And it should also be noted that the overuse here is defined in terms of frequency of use rather than in dose. And the important message here is that people with headaches should, of course, avoid overuse because otherwise they may develop a type of chronic daily headache called a medication overuse headache. So medication overuse headache is headache that is occurring on 15 days per month or more in a patient with pre-existing primary headache. This is usually migraine or tension type headache or both and developing as a consequence of regular overuse of acute headache medication on 10 or 15 days per month or more, depending on the class of medication uh, <clears throat> for more than three consecutive months. And uh, the headache usually resolves after overuse is stopped. The di diagnostic criteria for medication overuse headache are that headache should be occurring on 15 days per month or more in a patient with, pre with a pre-existing headache disorder. And there should be regular overuse of headache medication for more than three consecutive months. Uh, and the headache also that headache, the headache should not be a better, better accounted for by any other headache diagnosis. Uh, the field of headache has their own diagnostic criteria called the headache classif uh, uh, international classification of headache disorders. Yes. So for persons who have headache for more than 10 to 15 days per month, <clears throat> it's important to note that strategies other than acute medication must be used for those days exceeding the recommended, recommended limitations for use of uh, acute headache medication. And this includes, of course, non-pharmacological treatment and sometimes no treatment at all. And ideally, preventive measures should be taken so that the patient is not faced with this situation at all. Uh, this includes appropriate management of the primary episodic headache and, of course, patient information. So medication overuse headache uh, develops from primary episodic headache disorders, such as migraine and tension type headache. Approximately two thirds of those with medication overuse headache have had migraine as their uh, primary episodic headache. One third have had tension type headache and a very small fraction have had other headaches, such as, for example, cluster headache. And interestingly, overuse of acute uh, medication does not seem to cause headache in individuals without any pre-existing uh, primary headache disorder. For example, when analgesics were used daily to treat rheumatoid pain, they did not cause chronic daily headache in individuals without pre-existing headache disorders. But on the other hand, when used by people um, with pre-existing migraine, it was a strong risk factor for development of chronic daily headache. So there's a link here between the primary episodic headache and um, medication overuse headache. And uh, 
studies from different countries analyzing uh, medication overuse headache have found prevalences in the adult uh, population ranging between one and two percent. Uh, we conducted a large prevalence study in Sweden where we found a prevalence of around 1.8 percent in the adult general population. Medication overuse headache is more common among women than among men. The um, gender rate show is about two to three, three times more common among women than men. The primary headaches uh, from which the medication overuse headache is developed are also more common among women than men, but it should be noted that the gender gap is even bigger in medication overuse headache. It is most prevalent in page, patients aged between 40 and 60 years and thereby affecting pro productivity and work attendance. Known uh, risk factors are uh, low socioeconomic position, uh, stress, obesity, physical inactivity, and daily smoking. So, medication overuse headache is definitely a public health problem. It has implications for the, uh, for the individual uh, as well as for the society as a whole. Uh, in an estimation of how economic resources are lost to headache in Europe, uh, the mean annual per person cost for different types of headache was calculated. And the cost for medication overuse headache was higher than the corresponding cost for the episodic head headaches, such as migraine and tension type headache. Uh, and for all three types of headache, indirect costs such as sickness absence and reduced productivity at work were the dominating costs. People with medication overuse headache have also got a greater disease burden and a higher sickness absence than those with migraine. They also report a lower quality of life compared to those with episodic headaches. So this is uh, definitely a quite burdensome disorder for the individual patient. In my research team, we conducted a large telephone survey in Sweden where we identified 785 individuals with medication overuse headache. We asked them about their medication use and about their healthcare contacts. And on this slide, you can see uh, what they reported about their medication use. And as you can see, the most commonly used type of uh, acute medication was simple analgesics. More than half of the participants reported simple analgesics as their main acute medication. The second largest group was combination analgesics followed by tryptans, opioids and ergotamine. And the most commonly used specific compound was paracetamol. We also asked these individuals about uh, their healthcare contact or their consumption of healthcare. And we found that less than half said that they had visited a physician related to their headache during the previous year. And only 14% had seen a, a neurologist regarding their uh, headache disorder. And it should be kept in mind that these are people who had headache for at least 15 days per month. So they had quite serious headaches. And uh, almost half of them reported only using over-the-counter medications to treat their headache. This proportion was higher among the young than the old and lower among those who had only attended elementary school compared to those with a higher educational level. And it should also be noted that daily use of acute medication was reported by 46%, so almost half of them. Uh, <clears throat> the recommended treatment for medication overuse headache is patient education and uh, withdrawal. And with withdrawal, we mean discontinuation of acute medication or at least reduction to less than 10 days per month. There are several different strategies av available for, for withdrawal. It can, for example, be done uh, abruptly or gradual, and it can be done with or without the addition of prophylactic medication. Uh, and all these strategies work. I think you should, uh, it depends on the patient's situation, what, what's most suitable. And during the withdrawal, many patients experience worsening of the headache, nausea, and anxiety. And these symptoms can be quite tough for a patient to endure. But the symptoms usually improve after two to 10 days, although they can persist for up to four weeks. A majority of the patient experience a significant reduction in their headache uh, after withdrawal. 
And it should also be noted that patients overusing psychotropic medications, such as opioids, they may need extended support during the withdrawal process. So what is it like to live with medication overuse headache? We in my team, we wanted to know more about this. So we conducted a qualitative study where we interviewed individuals who fulfilled the diagnostic criteria for medication overuse headache. And the data collection and the analysis of the data was done according to grounded theory methodology. And we found that the participants of this study, <clears throat> these were Swedish, uh, Swedish individuals, adults who suffered from medication overuse headache, they viewed their acute medication as indispensable. And the reason they did this was because they perceived it to be the only thing that was effective against their headache. They described that without this medication, the negative consequences of the headaches would ruin their lives. And in that sense, they depended on the medication to maintain their current lifestyle. Uh, so they per perceived the headaches as something that threatened to ruin their lives. Uh, because of the headaches, they couldn't work, they couldn't take care of their families, they couldn't maintain social activities, etc. Uh, and despite extensive efforts, they had been unable to find any other effective aid besides the acute medication. And therefore, they regarded the acute medication as the only solution. And as a result, this medication became quite indispensable to them. And they avoided questioning their, their medication use by focusing on the headaches rather than keeping track of the uh, amount of medication use. And this process uh, eventually led to development of medication overuse headache. As I said previously, sorry, wrong slide. Uh, persons with medication overuse headache report very limited contact with healthcare and extensive use of over-the-counter medication. Many of them only use over-the-counter medication. And this means that for some of them, uh, pharmacy staff may be the only healthcare professionals that they regularly meet with. And because of that, uh, pharmacy staff and pharmacists have a key position in, in advising these patients about their headache treatment and about their medication use. And this is something I think we should uh, be aware of. However, uh, the question is, what do we know about the actual level of knowledge about medication overuse headache among pharmacy staff? Uh, this is important as it determines the quality of their advice regarding medication overuse headache. And in order to find out more about this, uh, we conducted a survey among 225 pharmacy employees in Sweden. Uh, they were asked questions about their background and on uh, advice on headache treatment and on their self-perceived and actual knowledge about medication overuse headache. And we found that almost half of the respondents reported that they were asked for advice on headache treatments every day. So this is clearly a common topic and a relevant topic at pharmacies. The majority consider themselves to have knowledge about medication overuse headache to some or a great extent. Uh, there was no difference in knowledge uh, between different professional categories at uh, the pharmacies. When it comes to the actual knowledge about the medication overuse headache, we asked a few questions in order to test their knowledge. And we found that less than 10% knew that all five medications listed, ergotamines, triptans, opioids, paracetamol, and ansides could cause development of medication overuse headache. And when we asked about recommended treatment advice, around 40% responded correctly. So we concluded that there is need for further education regarding medication overuse headache, at least at Swedish pharmacies. Because with the proper knowledge, pharmacy staff is extremely well positioned to affect prevention of medication overuse headache. So what can we do? Well, based on these findings, uh, 
our suggestion is increased educational efforts about medication overuse headache within pharmacy programs. This, what we're doing today, is also an example of increasing awareness and knowledge about medication overuse headache and treatment of uh, migraine intention type headache. Uh, continued education for all staff at the pharmacies, uh, and last but not least, initiatives to increase knowledge and awareness among pharmacy clients. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Penella, and thank you, Jacinta. Now, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. If anybody else has any questions for our speakers, please put them in the Q&A board. Um, I have one question here. What is the best medication for migraine and what are the precautions for migraine patients? I think you may have covered this, but if you could give a very brief recap, Jacinta, um, on your thoughts on that. I know you probably don't want to pick a particular favourite drug, but... Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's, uh, there are a lot of answers for that for different people. So different medications will be better tolerated or are more effective for different people. There are some head-to-head -head trials for different acute treatments for migraine, and there's some work uh, using a, a network meta-analysis technique where you compare or you bring all the data together from those head-to-head -head comparisons or, and also the indirect uh, data that's available. And from those studies, uh, their, their conclusion was that elotriptan may be the most suitable uh, and that ibuprofen may be the best tolerated. Uh, but it really depends on what your measurement of success is as well. So whether you want pain-free at two hours or pain uh, and nausea as your, your final endpoint. And so that it's really hard to say exactly what is the, the one best treatment. Uh, and then every medication will come with a, a whole range of different precautions. So all of the NSAIDs will have the, the precautions we know that apply for other conditions where we use NSAIDs. And then for the tryptans and agotamine, for example, all of those uh, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular are probably the main precautions to be aware of. Um, and each individual drug class has got lots of potential interactions and things as well. Uh, Penilla, did you have anything you wanted to add to Jacinta's answer or you? No, I think happy? it was a very, very good answer. I guess it's this is really a matter of uh, starting from the patient-centered approach, seeing what the individual patient uh, needs. Yeah, as with everything we do, patient-centered approaches. Yeah. Uh, I have another question here. Um, and I think this could be for both of you. Uh, should GPs or family doctors be allowed to initiate prophylactic treatment, specifically the CGRP antagonists in chronic migraine patients, or do you think a neurologist should be the only initiator in these products? Want me to start okay. on that one? <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. Um, so for... The less specialised prophylactic medications, I would fully support family doctors and GPs having the knowledge and the skills and encouraging them to appropriately prescribe prophylaxis for patients with migraine. I don't think prophylaxis itself should be restricted to neurologists. In terms of the, the highly specialised or the, the newer medications, the CGRP um, antagonists, particularly the monoclonal antibodies, that may be dependent on where you're based and what the funding and access mechanisms are. So um, in some regions, they'll only be funded if the medication has been prescribed by a neurologist. So in that situation, our hands are sort of tied to a degree. Um, but I guess in a broader sense, we are seeing more biologics uh, moving into kind of standard care and general practice in general. So maybe one day we'll get there with GPs prescribing these as well. Chronic migraine is a bit of a, a beast in itself, though, if someone has got to the point of having a formal diagnosis of chronic migraine, um, they are likely to need the care of a neurologist anyway. Over to you, Penilla. 
Thank you. I perfectly agree. I think it looks perhaps quite differently in different uh, countries also what, uh, what neurologists are expected to do and what GPs are expected to do. But I agree. I think it's uh, generally that prophylactics are underused. Uh, more, pa more migraine patients could be helped by having prophylaxis. So uh, encouraging GPs to prescribe prophylactics, I think, is a good idea. But uh, as you as you uh, said now and also in your presentation, some of the prophylactics are quite complicated and especially the new ones. So this would be an indication to uh, um, include a neurologist in the decision, I think. Excellent. Uh, another question. What are the best methods for pharmacists to identify OTC medication overuse since patients might attend numerous pharmacies for OTCs? I might ask you, Penilla, to take the lead on that one because your research has given some insight. Yeah, thank you. This is a very highly relevant question, I think. And it's, of course, it's impossible because we, we are not the police, we cannot uh, force people to talk to us in the pharmacies. And of course, some, sometimes people, but I mean, also considering that some of the medications used here are medications that are used for other indications as well, such as simple analgesics. So some people may buy a lot of sim simple analgesics because they're buying them for the entire family. And so we cannot force people to talk to us, I think, about this. But I think it's a good idea to... Um, take every opportunity to ask about uh, headache treatment, why they're using it, if they need to, if they need advice, if they want advice, really take all opportunities given. And uh, if there is a patient, uh, a client who wants to talk uh, to us, we should definitely take the opportunity to inform about medication overuse, headache and uh, good treatment op options in migraine, of course, as well. Um, and I think it's also very different in different pharmacies because some pharmacies, we do not know our clients at all. They're, they're just people coming in from the street. And in other pharmacies, we have closer relations uh, with our clients. And then it's, of course, a, a different story that we can uh, inform on in, in a different uh, way. Jacinta, have you got anything further to add to that? Nothing further to add. I think that's very comprehensive. I think so too. Uh, now we've got a couple of other questions. Some I'm not really sure if they are a question. I've got one on how to control certain deep pain. I feel like that might be a little bit beyond our remit on migraines. So we might not be able to answer that unless either of you feel that you have some insight. I've got another one on has cannabis been looked at with regards to treatment? Now I'm suspecting that might be prophylactic treatment rather than acute but perhaps it's both um, do either of you have any sort of idea of any research that might be going on in that particular sphere um, I can maybe get things started I'm certainly not an expert in the area um, of medical marijuana um, for migraine use but I know there has been some interest in it and um, like a lot of pain conditions uh, I'm aware of at least one systematic review that did have some positive outcomes um, for the use of medical marijuana in, I believe it was the uh, acute treatments, like using it um, as an abortive therapy, but they had a big sort of disclaimer at the bottom saying that larger and, and longer lasting clinical trials are required to kind of confirm those effects. So um, maybe an emerging area um, certainly hasn't made it through to any treatment guidelines that I've seen yet. Um, but I may, I'll hand over to you, Penilla, if you know any more about this sort of emerging space. Uh, I don't really have anything to add. Okay, it might be a watch this space and see what happens. There's been quite a lot of developments, certainly in the last five years, which is unusual because most drugs are well established but so this is obviously an area of uh, growth and development and a lot of research so there could be something you know we could be talking about this in five years time that cannabis is the new thing but as yet nothing substantial has come to light in research um moving along i have a, a more a statement paracetamol and caffeine is becoming very popular um otc as a medicine treatment here in the Philippines. Um, it says, please advise, 
What are your thoughts on that combination treatment? And it is something that is readily available in a lot of countries now since codeine has been restricted. Um, what are your thoughts on its immediate efficacy and maybe its long-term use? Uh, maybe Penilla to start because she's been doing OTC. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I think it's a fairly... Uh, I'm positive. It's used a lot. We saw it in in our study when we uh, asked people with me medication overuse headache what they were using. This was one of the most common compounds that they were using. Not to imply that it's uh, bad in that sense, more that it's it's popular. Uh, and uh, but as Jacinta said during her presentation, I think it's a little bit individual here how patients react to caffeine. So. Uh, I guess it's uh, once again back to the patient-centeredness. It's a uh, trial and error thing, uh, but it's quite, uh, how, do, how do you say the English word? It's e uh, available uh, and not very expensive medication as well. So in that sense, it's also good. Is there um, anything further? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think caffeine can have a difficult relationship with headaches in general and with migraine. So we find some patients that uh, if they have too much caffeine and then they stop having it, they get a caffeine withdrawal headache or that can be a trigger for them or other people that if they have too much caffeine at the peak of the dose, they'll get headache. Uh, for other people, not having um, it, not having regular caffeine can yeah, cause those headaches as well. So it maybe depends on their overall caffeine intake can, considering that it's coming from analgesics potentially as well as um, other dietary sources. But as an analgesic, if it's just used intermittently every now and again, uh, I think, yeah, caffeine is a useful additive um, for a lot of people. I actually just have a follow-up on this. Do we encourage patients with hypertension or heart diseases to use that combination of paracetamol and caffeine? Uh, I can start off with that, I guess. So caffeine has potential to increase heart rate and therefore increase blood pressure. So there is at least that, that short-term risk of increasing blood pressure there. So if someone had really uncontrolled hypertension or was very, very high cardiovascular risk, then you might be more cautious about it. Uh, but only in the same way that you would give them sort of lifestyle advice to potentially restrict caffeine intake if they were in that really high risk cardiovascular group anyway. So I don't think it's an absolute uh, contraindication, just having a diagnosis of high blood pressure, um, but it, it is a risk to take into consideration. Um can you advise on any alternative, so non-pharmaceutical treatments for migraine or headaches? So things like hydration, mineral supplementation with cream of tartar. Um, that's a kind of a question statement. That's rich in potassium and magnesium. Does anyone know if that is effective using supplementation of those products in migraines or headaches? Either of you. Sure. Um, I'm I can... not sure exactly where to direct that one. Sure. Um, I think in general, dehydration can be a trigger for headaches, whether it's a, a specific migraine trigger for an individual, uh, it's unclear, but I, I don't think it's ever bad advice to recommend someone stays well hydrated. Uh, in terms of the product in particular, or the, the substance mentioned there, uh, I don't know about that individual substance, but there is some evidence for migraine supplementation uh, in the treatment of migraine, not not bounds of evidence, not enough for us to be recommending it to everyone, uh, but particularly in migraine patients who have been found to be deficient in migraine, uh, not migraine, deficient in magnesium, supplementing that can be beneficial. So it may be that there's something, uh, some evidence or or something behind this suggestion if it's something that the, the attendee has heard works. My guess would be that it, if, if it does work, it may be related to the magnesium component. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Look, there were a lot of questions um, and we are running out of time. So I might get those questions that have been submitted in the Q&A. We will answer those offline and include those answers in an email uh, mail out after, just to make sure that we get through everything. 
because we do have our lovely eight questions again to make sure everyone has learnt. Uh, so we will be running those polls again. And I think we might even be showing the answers this time um, and how, how well we've improved on our previous answers. Okay. Once again, here's our first question. So now we know which of the following statements regarding the general principles of migraine management is false. Please choose your answer. Question number two, the dose of which tryptin should be reduced by half in patients taking propranolol due to a drug-drug interaction? Question three, which of the following counselling points is most appropriate to discuss with a patient who is using lasmidiptran? Question four, which of the medications below should not be taken daily for migraine prophylaxis?
Question five, which of the following is not a diagnostic criterion for medication overuse headache? Which of the following patients is not at risk of developing medication overuse headache if they continue using medications in the same way as described? Question seven, which treatments can contribute to development of medication overuse headache if overused? And final question, how can pharmacists help prevent medication overuse headache? Okay, uh, Ruben, are we showing the poll results or the answers? Uh, for future FIP digital events and for a copy of the presentation, uh, please visit the events.fip.org. Um,
think people would very much like to see the poll results if that's at all possible. Maybe not. I'd like to thank all of you for attending. We did have over 400 participants in this webinar, which was great. Um, and thank you very much to our wonderful speakers and to the great FIP staff who organised this and for accepting me for being a little bit late, getting stuck on a train. Um, Ruben, if you want to jump in with anything further. You there. Thank you, Tara. I think that's it. Well, we can send the answers via email if, if needed. So I'll just drop my email in the box. Yeah, I think there were a lot of people who were very keen on getting some answers. So um, if that could be done. And if anybody wanted a copy of the presentation, it will be available as the whole presentation with our speakers uh, on the FIP website. So thank you very much. And I, I think we're done.